on very important issues. But I'd like to go back to the, the full topic, not to answer it, but to put it in a perspective. Is full employment possible? That's easy, solves, saves, saves a lot of time. The idea that, uh, imp that full employment is not possible goes back more than 100 years to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, or especially when it had big impact on agriculture. And it gained great momentum with the population explosion after the 1950s when uh, medical technology dramatically reduced infant mortality and we saw this big boost in population which began to reach working age in the 70s and 80s particularly and by the 90s was quite daunting. At that time we did a study in India where seven million youth were entering the workforce every year, seven million, and we asked whether full employment was possible in India. Nobody had ever asked the question because the answer was so obvious, no, it's not possible. And we worked on a strategy and showed that we could create 100 million jobs within 10 years. And we didn't expect anybody to take us seriously but from the prime minister down, the government took it very seriously and implemented a strategy uh, in the early 90s to address it when, when new entrants was 7 million a year. Now, put it in perspective, creating 100 million jobs in 10 years is equivalent to how many jobs the U.S. created in the 20th century, 100 million jobs. We wanted to do it in 10 years. Now, the situation in India is, that there are 12 million youth entering the workforce, not 7 million, 12 million a year. And yet, wages continue to rise, salaries continue to rise. Uh, the, it's difficult to find labor, even unskilled labor, let alone skilled labor of different sorts, uh, because the society is expanding. So I think the issue no longer is whether or not we can absorb the population. We have absorbed the population, and if you look at the data, I'm, I don't have time to present it, but over the last, since 1950, job growth has been faster than working age population growth in the world, in the world as a whole. It doesn't mean we haven't had ups and downs as we had in Europe after the end of the Cold War with the dislocations, with reunification of Germany and everything. Population is not the problem. Now we have a problem up until after 2008. We do have a problem of rising unemployment in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. And I would say neoliberalism has been the problem. The policies have been the problem, not the inherent incapacity of global society to find meaningful ways for each human being to employ their activities for productive purposes. And uh, uh, Eric has touched on some of those issues, and we, we've had days and days of conferencing on what is fundamentally wrong with our economic policies our economic institutions, and our economic theory. We are still incentivizing capital investments, energy-intensive investments. We're, shift, we're putting all our money into fossil fuels, which are, uh, which are threatening the planet, instead of the kind of shift uh, that's necessary to make livelihoods for everybody and sustainable development for everybody possible. Now we've come here, not talking about population, not talking about neoliberalism, we're talking about technology and the fourth industrial revolution. Is it a threat? Is it going to wipe out all jobs? If we continue the way we are, it can do it, just like uh, uh, neoliberalism has done it or uh, anything else has done it. It can do it unless we recognize that the results of technology depend on our policies. We have incentivizing capital investments in energy intensive, capital in intensive ways to remove and make people not only dispensable, but an irrelevant productive resource. We have widening inequality. We have lower and lower amounts of the uh, income generated by business going to labor, uh, more and more going to shareholders. 
used to buy back shares and everything, uh, and in many other ways that we don't have time to discuss. What the result of technology is going to depend on the policy framework within which we're implementing these new technologies. If we're going to leave them unregulated the, la the way we've left global financial systems, markets unregulated for the last 30 years, it will be a real challenge. It doesn't mean that it's inevitable. And the, the theme that's come out here very well with our existing speakers and in earlier sessions is that there is a growing mismatch between the, the education we're giving and the, the needs of the workplace today and the evolving needs of technology. It doesn't mean these are really valid issues, but it's all in a wider context. And if that wasn't enough, we've got another issue now breathing down our throats. Giovanni politely uh, referred to it, but he could have put with fire and brimstone instead of that. Regardless, the real tech threat is not technology, the real threat is the environment. The real threat is we cannot continue to try to raise the well-being of humanity simply by multiplying economic growth perpetually in the same old dead model that's destroying the planet. So the challenges are really real. My only reason for putting this in a framework is, edu can education solve the employment problem by itself? I think absolutely not. Can we continue with the education we have and expect to solve the employment problem? Absolutely not. We've got a crisis here, or you can call it an opportunity, I'm an optimist, but we need a radical change in educational institutions as we need in our economic institutions, our economic policy, our business framework, and in every part of the society. And that's why the World Academy is not specializing in employment or economics, though we have programs on all of them, unless we look at the whole picture. We are in a complex, interconnected world. Unless we look at the linkage between our education and our economics and our monetary theory and our social and our democracy, our economic policies now are undermining, I referred to it on the opening morning, they're undermining the stability of democratic institutions in the world, creating new polarizations, uh, spurring popularization, uh, and all right-wing extremism. We have to look at this as a whole, and that's why uh, a number of our speakers have emphasized that we can't use this fragmented analytic thinking that looks at one problem or one aspect at a time. We've got to look at the, we've got to learn, our education has to change at a fundamental level of the way we view reality. We've got not only to know that there are lots of pieces to the puzzle, but we have to keep in mind what's the whole purpose of this. What is the whole purpose of the society we've created? Our education is not just for jobs. Our econ economy is not just for GDP. It's for the well-being of everybody on the planet. And that means it's not enough we change our institutions. We have to change at the level of theory. In the academy, we have an international working group on economic theory. Half of the members are not even economists because we have to look at it in its entirety as a social phenomenon. We need a reframing, not just of the way we teach. We need a reframing of the research and the thinking that's done in society. We can't afford to divide the disciplines, not just because students need different skills, but because our thinking is no longer valid in a society, if it was ever fully valid, in a society which is so complex. So the, the, the lessons and messages go very deep. Institutional change is not enough. Policy change is not enough. Change in our theory is not enough. Change in our pedagogy is not enough by itself. Change in our fundamental thinking. So I'm not saying this in any way in, as in a, in, with pessimism. I'm just trying to chart out, I think, the way we have to, the way I think we should be looking at the problem is a global problem, is an integrated problem, and there are solutions. We know the solutions. We know the solutions to stimulate employment. We know solutions for improving education. We're highlighting a number of them here. We know we need a shift 
from this passive transfer of information to developing thinking uh, uh, and uh, in the individuals. But most of the education in the world is still just transfusion of information. Uh, and uh, and I, I work in countries where I see it all the time. We know that the development of the person and the capacity of the person to adapt the personality of the person is absolutely essential to live in this complex world. And what they learn academically may be less important than the development of their values, the development of their social skills, their capacity to work and collaborate with each other. Uh, business tells us very clearly, you spend so many years training students to compete with each other, work alone and compete with each other. Once they come into our company, they never do anything alone. And the one thing we look for is collaboration and cooperation. And very few of them are really qualified for that. So I think the message I'd like to bring from, take away from this session is, education is absolutely important and radical change is necessary. It's not sufficient by itself, and we have to integrate that education, but education is not just about teaching. Education are, is, is, has the presiding, ruling ideas that are governing society today. So it's not just what we teach in the classroom, it's what we think in our disciplines. And if multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary thinking is necessary in the classroom, it's even more necessary at the theoretical level, because it's those policies, political, economic, social policies, cultural policies, that are the, th the thinking on which they're based, the fundamental thinking on which they're based that is determining, we see it as a result in the society. Thank you. <laughs>